Greetings, ladies, gentlemen, and that wonderful prism in between. My name is Kennedy Phillips. I am what you would call a sound designer, which is just a fancy word for saying I bang pots together for a living. I've worked on Magus Elgar, Husband Hotel, Hell of a Boss, Satina, and many more animations. You are watching Two Geeks Talking. Stay tuned. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented actor, voice actor, audio engineer extraordinaire. He has many talents that uh, I want to dive into every single aspect of his life and his career. But we're joined today because he has a Kickstarter campaign. And we're joined today by the ever-talented Kennedy Phillips. How are you doing today, Kennedy? I'm just marveling at how buttery smooth your voice is. Very nice. Thank you for the introduction. It's half genetics and half, you know, working as a call center for three and a half years. Yeah, I imagine that would probably smooth all the edges off of your voice. <laughs> we're not trying to dredge up my past. We're trying to dredge up yours. So oh, in that regard, <laughs> thank you for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, hi, I'm Kennedy Phillips. I am I'm the creator of uh, Magus Elgar, and this cat uh, walking by is Rika. Say hello, Rika. Oh, she's gone already. Uh, I am the sound designer of The Sojourn, which is an audio, a sci fi audio drama. And you might probably know me from work on uh, Has Been Hotel and Hell of a Boss, which are uh, two animated series that are currently available on YouTube and have a cumulative probably 100 million views across the series. It's crazy. How did you get? into your profession as not only an audio engineer, but also as a voice actor as well, too? Well, I, I started doing entertainment when I was really young. When I used to live on a sailboat, there'd be like these long legs of just nothing while we're trying to get from one place to the next. And I would improvise fake commercials with my sister uh, to entertain my parents. They always loved it. And it, it got me into doing silly voices. It got me into doing, uh, like coming up with writing for, for fun little skits to do that extended into school where I would, I would like write scripts for, for plays that for, for like presentations or whatever. Like my, the first thing I ever wrote for like a show or anything, it was a parody of Homer's The Odyssey. And I think I was in third grade where I ended up stabbing the narrator and he died and we had to replace the narrator. <laughs> it was it was really funny because it was just like unlike anything that they were expecting like a third grader to do. So I figured that like I, I wanted to work in film. I wanted to work in, in cartoons. I wanted to, I wanted to do entertainment things and I, I would make like home videos with like a a really crummy eight millimeter like high eight camera and i would i would like edit on a vcr and i would make stories about my dog as a as like a noir detective but with none of the black and white and none of the good acting or story or set design at all when i went to high school i learned editing and all the tricks of the trade that I needed to do to actually get to college and start that career. And I found out when I got to my master's program in editing, I was the worst one in the room. <laughs> and that was, yes. that was hard to swallow. So I had to work really hard to fix what was wrong with me uh, in, in my skills. But I also discovered that I was apparently really good at sound design. Because during college, I would mess around and make uh, audio dramas of little skits where I would do all the voices and like some small sound design work. All of my colleagues would say, wow, you're actually really good at sound design. Like, why don't you do that? And I'm like, huh, yeah, I, I might as well. <laughs> it's not that different from what I'm doing with editing. And I, I shifted over to that and found it was like, my higher calling because I was really good at doing the sound design portions. Well, that was the one thing I, I noticed just in looking not only at uh, Magus Elgar, but uh, some of your other works as well, too. And, and even looking at your reels, you know, the range of your voice acting along with the sound design, especially listening to 
Magus Elgar specifically. Like I loved the the ambience and the the auditory aspect of of not only of the voice acting but also of just the action that was going on and little things I could pick up in the background was just amazing. I love seeing how a scene can if I close my eyes I can still visually see it, you know. I love seeing that that transition from audio into, you know, my own subconscious. I love that you're doing such an amazing job with it. So this is a, I, I'm going to have a ball, a ball talking with you about this. So <laughs> I'm really glad that you enjoy it. Um, sound design is kind of one of those fields that a lot of people really don't think about, especially in film. Like not not you rarely run into people who are who just finished watching like a Marvel movie and are like, wow, the sound design was so good. Like who who says that other than film geeks and people who have watched. Uh, Marvel movies way too much for their own good. Well, let's let's look into the sound design aspect. We'll talk about, of course, Magus Hugger as well, too, mm-hmm. for sure. But why is sound design such an important aspect, not only for audio dramas, but for film in general, from your perspective? Uh, when it comes to sound design, I'm not talking about composing or or the dialogue or even the the sounds that you hear between scenes like footsteps and clothing rustle and the like. When I'm talking about sound design, I'm talking about the stuff that helps you engross yourself in a location. We rely on a lot of our senses to help ground us in a scene. And when it comes to audio, it's really interesting because it's one of the easiest senses to trick. Now, when it comes to um, eyes, obviously you've got like optical illusions and the like, and we get away with that with like some compositing, with some with some clever cinematography, et cetera, et cetera. But for sound, it's actually a little bit easier to trick the mind into thinking something is something else. I, I, I hearken back to one of the earliest lessons in the relevance of juxtaposition for film. Alfred Hitchcock showed how you can pair some scenes in editing and change someone's opinion of a character. It's kind of a classic example, but it's it's a picture of an old man who is kind of looking at something and it cuts to a woman with giving candy to a baby, cuts back to the man and he smiles. What's what's the conclusion you get about that man? Well, he's a pretty, he's a nice guy. He he enjoys children. He he enjoys the simple things in life. But if you've replaced the picture of uh, the woman uh, giving candy to a baby with a a woman like taking her top off, and he smiles, well, now that man's lecherous. He's mm-hmm. he's he's he is a horny old man that shouldn't be allowed near people. <laughs> and, but that's that's just something that you piece together in your head. And we use that kind of technique to associate sound effects with certain things. Like, you don't, you don't know what a Tyrannosaurus Rex would sound like. Like, you don't know what they would sound like. But if you juxtapose whatever sound that we ended up coming up with, with that sound, well, then it clicks in your head. Okay, that's what the sound is. That's what he sounds like. The sound of someone getting punched in the face, it's, it doesn't sound anything like what a real punch would sound like. For example, it's not very impactful at the most. It's like two sticks of meat flapping against each other. <laughs> oh, it, it's not very impressive or, or impactful. But what we're doing is we are enhancing it by by creating illusions and juxtaposing other sounds, putting them together. and building what you would expect for it to sound like. The way that that ends up happening is you end up finding a lot of sound effects and a lot of like ambience in scenes and movies that really draw you into the to the locale. And with those creative interpretations of those sound effects, you get an idea in your head of how this world sounds and you become more of a part of it. It's it's not just enough for a movie like Avatar with James Cameron to be engrossed in it by just having like a lot of really cool, crisp visuals. Like if it was just the visuals, it'd be like, well, that's a pretty painting, but I, I could just yeah. go to a museum. But the, the sound design in that movie is spectacular. You can close your eyes and feel yourself in Pandora just by all the 
things surrounding you with the 80 speakers that they probably used to make that movie. Definitely. So I have to ask this then, what is your favorite your favorite sound effect and what is your least favorite sound effect? my favorite sound effect i have on my phone there's a movie a long time ago that came out called sunshine mm -hmm. sunshine is a movie about a bunch of scientists who get in a spaceship and go and fly to the sun to drop a stellar bomb in it to restart it it is the exact same plot as the core mm -hmm. but it's taken seriously and it is actually quite good uh, the, the, it's it's good until like the like the last third of that movie. But what I love about it is that there is this ethereal quality to some of the sound effects it come up with. My favorite sound is something that's incredibly expressive and tells a lot of a story without you knowing what it is right away. You, you understand a lot of things about what is emanating this sound just by hearing it. Uh, in, in a scene, there is a, a gentleman who his name is eluding me at the moment, uh, who's in charge of listening to stellar phenomena. He actually like listens to like a little radio broadcast of like space sounds and frequencies that are that are transmitting through the air. And he kind of like leans forward to listen to a very unique sound that seems to be almost chirping millions of miles away and i'm going to play that song sound for you right now you later That's learn cool. that it's the sound of like a distress beacon but just from that sound you could piece together so many things about like what it means, what it's invoking in you. It's, it's alien. It's strange, but it's also like kind of sad alone in, in a lot of ways. And I know that I'm getting a little bit too artsy fartsy with that kind of thing, but like, I, I love that sound because it has, it does so much storytelling in so little time. <laughs> Now, in terms of my least favorite sound, um, I, I would have to say there's like a particular uh, pterodactyl sound that I hear from like really bad monster movies um, that I hear all the time. And it's not that the sound itself is bad, is bad. It's that whenever I hear it, it is usually an indication of a of a movie that did not respect its sound design enough to give its creature, its own design work. I watched a movie, a horror movie, which sound design is so important in horror. Like nine out of 10, this movie is great with the exception of one department and that's its sound design, The Babadook. Uh, the Babadook is a, an Australian film about a woman who is dealing with the loss of her husband and is dealing with a difficult child. And a lot of her life is getting haunted by this children's book monster called the babadook which is this like really creepy like a guy from a pop-up book with like a top hat and like a really like unsettling grin like nine out of ten this film is great there's something about the sound design that that's missing a very important quality to it uh it, it is quiet for a lot of the film and there's like a lot of times where they're just like doing scrubbing or other things and they they occasionally like do something really cool with like the babadook's voice but then comes the big moment where you get to see the monster finally reveal itself and it looms over the main character and is ready to like be menacing and be scary and then you hear a stock pterodactyl sound as its roar and you're like i'm completely taken out of this movie now <laughs> You could have put anything else there and it would have worked better. Yeah, like um, that's why it's my, my least favorite sound because like I cannot tell you how many times that specific sound effect has taken me out of a movie. <laughs> well, then let's dive into, into your current work, of course, with Magus Elgar. You know, you told us about the creation of this series early on here, but because of your talents in sound design and, and voice acting, everything like that, um, why was this? story and this program uh, important to be created 
this was ultimately a test to see if I could direct. And that's what it started as. But um, I, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more impactful, more, I guess, <sighs> meteor, I suppose would be a word for it, than just like, can I direct? Um, I, I really don't like half-assing things. I really don't like having to do something where I just say that's good enough because for, for the longest time, everything that I did had this like amateurish spin to it. That always drove me nuts because um, when I was growing up, I was diagnosed with dysgraphia, which is kind of like what, uh, you know how like what your your brain jumbles up words when you're reading text? Uh, dysgraphia kind of does the same thing in reverse where like you're trying to translate to writing. So like your hand just kind of like, uh, like you try to draw a straight line and it kind of like goes. <laughs> I, I did like a lot of it, like occupational therapy to like get myself to actually write in classes, but I always would feel that wiggle in everything I would do like that, that, that awkward, this is very much done by someone who doesn't know what they're doing kind of feel. And that drove me crazy. So I said, all right, if I'm going to direct something, I want to make sure that it is as high quality, as polished as I can possibly make it. I want this to be a, a magnum opus of what I am capable of doing at this present time. So I put like all my life savings into this and dove full force into trying to make this as best as I could make it. And, you know, I wanted to have like fun creating something that I, I would love to watch. I loved watching uh, Terry Pratchett's old work when I was uh, in college. I, I loved going through like a fantasy setting that would have like a lot of really fun, interesting things to discover about the world. I loved, I loved sci-fi and, and how imaginative they are about the expression of the human condition. I really wanted to make my own world, but something that was as absurd as the places that I fell in love with. Like I could, I could have made a Harry Potter story if I wanted, but the Harry Potter world outside of like the magic casters themselves, I don't find as terribly interesting because it's, it's very much like a traditional like British lore kind of thing. Whereas with, with my setting, I wanted to, I wanted to play around with a bunch of different ideas. And I, I started safe at first, but the more that I spent time with it, the more I started extrapolating and exploring ideas, like exploring the nature of magic, the, the way that the planets shaped actually tells a little bit of uh, like how ridiculous this world is, where it's the, the whole world of Magus Elgar is about something that you feel like you understand until you get a closer look at it. One, one of my favorite jokes that I came up with really early on that kind of spells a lot about how the world of Hearth kind of works. In my setting, uh, two scientists find themselves in the magical world of Hearth, a banana-shaped planet that spins between two, that, that uh, boomerangs between two, star, uh, two stars that circle each other. The doctor in that show, Dr. Gra Horatio, uh, expresses to Magus Elgar, my main character, about how complicated science is, that sometimes we don't know all the answers. And he explained this through uh, the, the quantum theory of uh, zero shift, which is the idea that the rules change, the rules to the laws of physics change just by observing it, which is such a really like mind-bending concept in science of like, why is it that us watching it changes the rules of reality? It's almost like there's, there's something happening in, in, in the background of like something going on. For somebody like Magus Elgar, who lives in the world of Hearth, he goes, well, it makes perfect sense. You're giving them stage fright. <laughs> it's, it's something that like seems like such a simple explanation, but it's just that shit insane if you were looking at it from a scientific perspective. Oh, that's amazing. So then what did you draw from to create these characters itself? Like not only just from Magus, but, uh, but everyone that's kind of in the main cast. So many of the characters are 
exaggerations of aspects of my own personality. Um, mm -hmm. For example, Megas Elgar is that that childlike glee that I have for sharing projects with people, like sharing stuff that I love with other people. It's it's so exciting. It's so wonder wondrous. It's also kind of annoying, <laughs> um, especially if you don't really care. And I I, I brought that to eleven. Uh, where he he is such a excitable child about magic that he just gets very easily distracted by every by by it and ignores everything else, which makes him pretty immature. There there is that that feeling of responsibility of wanting to be careful about how I do things, you know, trying to make sure I don't hurt anybody, et cetera. That that kind of went in with Udo. And, and I, I extrapolated that from other people that I know in my life. For example, uh, Kaylee Fawn was a very dramatic interpretation of how I saw my sister in, in like when, when, I, when I lived with her um, when we were growing up, where she's this like really a, a, just a, a really enjoyable person to be around, is very confident, is very sure of herself, uh, is very smart but also probably kind of a supervillain <laughs> and, and has very little patience for people getting in her way, but not like in a malicious way, more of like, mm -hmm. you can't do that. That's against the rules. Well, why is it against the rules? This is much faster. <laughs> now that you've put this all together and you have a Kickstarter campaign currently ongoing, which by the way, when does that end? That ends November 20th. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the Kickstarter I'm working on right now is called Clutch, a Cobalt Story. It takes place in the same universe as Megas Elgar, but many years in the past, during the Age of Dragons, where dragons ran rampant and were the dominant force of magic in Hearth. It focuses on three kobolds who go on an adventure to try and find a new dragon master after they accidentally kill their old one. It stars uh, Book the Booker, who is a very well-read kobold in that he is the only kobold in uh, their clan that knows how to read. Uh, Dom the Helther, who really only knows how to drink healing potions and, and kiss boo-boos to make it better. And Strap the Trapper, who is our lead and builds traps to try and protect the kobolds from, from outside dangers, such as the dragon slayer Krillius Spine Shatter, who will be chasing after them, trying to stop their efforts on finding a new dragon. The story aims to be about six episodes long, so it's like a little short, but we're doing this as kind of like a testing ground for if we can actually do Kickstarters for Make Us Elgar in the future. And with luck, we will make a really good show that people will really enjoy. You will have the opportunity to listen to it absolutely free. But if you decide to back us on Kickstarter, you'll be able to get early access to the show, uh, access to the soundtrack that you can use for your own tabletop games. You can learn about how to make your own audio drama with a, a class by yours truly. Or if you want to be extra super fancy, you have the opportunity to sponsor an episode and we'll make an advertisement about whatever you want. It doesn't even have to be an advertisement. It can be just be a commercial about just you or have you do like a, a little minute long skit about the kobolds being stupid or something. Just whatever you want, we'll do it. That's great. I did get to listen to some of the, the excerpts from the YouTube channel itself. And I loved the range that that's in there. Now, you're not the only person doing the voice acting. Absolutely not. Oh. Actually, I'm not doing any of the voices in Clutch oh. a Cobalt story right now. I'm just directing and writing and sound designing it. So, you know, I've, I've got plenty of my hands all <laughs> over it like a messy infant. In Megas Elgar, I did do a couple of voices. I did a single episode villain named the Great Fantava. It's kind of like this charlatan that pretends he can speak to the dead, but it turns out to be like a device he found in some back somebody's backyard. And I also play Megas Sigari, who is a Lacertus that lives at the top of a tower that floats above a hearth held aloft by a dead space whale that I accidentally activated after trying to experiment how it manages to fly through the air. I do weather reports now. I, I, I hope you've actually heard of them before. Um, I also play as uh, Magus Serling Tenthorn, a uh, lovable Quanfluf Magus who teaches you about the world of Hearth and how magic works in it. So then who are the voice actors for 
to Kickstarter. Book is played by LRBJ, who is a gentleman I found in. Um, hi again, cat. Hello. There we go. <laughs> Ellaby J, who I met uh, on YouTube, uh, he has a very delightful series called Sibylline Sounds, which is about like a bunch of like cute cartoon characters just reading books to you or talking about relaxing things and stuff. And it's it's very endearing and, and very wholesome. Nam is voiced by uh, Joanna Christina, who uh, was the original voice of Nam when I was test driving this series on uh, BBC. Uh, which this almost was a BBC series, fun fact. You might actually know of the voice actor for Strap. He's voiced by Michael Kovac, who plays as Angel Dust in Has Been Hotel, uh, as well as a bunch of other voices all over the, the internet. Uh, recently, he played as N in Murder Drones, which is an animated oh, pilot yeah. that just came out like a few days ago, and it's really well done. And he's also the dragon in Dragon Goes House Hunting and is the most precious cinnamon bun I have ever heard as a dragon. It's it's really cute. Like the first time I saw this dragon that he was voiced as, like this dragon was like in pajamas in a in a mansion, but like it's like an actual like scary looking dragon, but wearing really cute pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at everything that you've put together as as this is your current magnum opus until you create your your next one, because I, I think you're going to have many more projects in the future as well. Mm -hmm. too. You have too much talent to not do that. Um, what was some of the positives that you took away from completing at least your first episode? And what were some of the negatives that you knew you could change and work on for other episodes? Well, for Magus Elgar... I, I, I was very green about like how I wanted to present these kinds of shows because I really just wanted to have fun. And I, I confess my first issue with the first episode of Mega Elgar was that it's not very interesting in terms of characters and plot. Like, yeah, there's like a really fun, exciting dragon fight. But then like the rest of the episode, like Magus and Udo are just kind of talking about how magic works and about this cauldron they found and that they should probably cast magic at this cauldron they found it doesn't seem like much for a 20 minute episode but the like the fact that like i made like i dedicated i would say almost 17 minutes to this cauldron they found is a little might have been a bit of an oversight the other problem that i i freely acknowledged that i had was that my my show lacked a critical amount of representation and that was more to the fact that I wasn't very well experienced in writing a lot of characters of like varying types. I always just had like, okay, is this a voice that I could do when I was writing a lot of them? That was a mistake. Like that was a really big mistake because some of my best moments came from Sandra Espinosa and uh, Kalinda Gray, who were like two of like four or five like female leads in my show. I only had like one female lead and I felt like I could do more with that. Going forward, we have a lot more of a more varied supporting cast and cast in general. Um, and I plan on like having more fun with that in the future, but could, because like I, one, one thing that I am, I'm really excited about is that like, we have like a bunch of different races that have like a wide range of different, different things about their cultures. Uh, for example, uh, we have a race that we're going to be being introduced to called phantasmids, which are like this really, really varied race of, uh, insects. But they're not like insects like like roaches and ants and stuff like yes they those do exist and so do spiders but also like moths and bees and and like uh butterflies and and tons of other types of things where like they're they're very like expressive they're very very dramatic and they're very like big about making a big name for themselves and they're their demographic is all over the place. Like they, they actually do not identify as any like singular uh, gender nine times out of 10. Like any ones that do just simply decided to. It's, it's very non-binary. Mm. Not, not in like the traditional binary sense that like humans would have. And there, there's a lot of fun to be had there in terms of like making f interesting characters and also having the opportunity to have a lot of 
you know, representation, which of course we would have for like other people, but for Clutch of Cobalt story, like the story is mostly about kobolds. So <laughs> that there aren't there there's like maybe one or two humans in in this series. And that what like that one human is like our main villain. <laughs> You're obviously having fun not only writing these uh, these series and these characters and everything like that, but also putting everything together and you're showcasing your talents as well, too. That's that's a byproduct of what you're creating. What was the hardest scene for you to write in this series? Magus Elgar, the hardest scene that I had to write was at the very end where I needed to have a logic fight with a character that I had introduced in the last two episodes about the nature of of magic, creativity, and the risks that come with it. I needed to have a debate on both sides of an argument of magic is dangerous. People who use magic end up getting hurt, or the people that are subjected to that magic get hurt or, or die. Sometimes dying happens. And the debate is, wouldn't it be much safer to just not do it and then do other things why why is experimenting with magic so important in this setting and i had to come up with a very interesting way for one of my characters to explain that because if they didn't they would die but the big thing about it is they have the opinion that magic is bad, or at the very least, magic is is far more dangerous than it's worth. Like uh, one of our characters had been wrestling with the notion that, well, maybe magic might not be worth it because look at how many people get hurt. Look at how look at how reckless Magus Elgar is uh, about about using magic in the first place. Wouldn't it just be better not to? Wouldn't it be safer for everybody not to? And that was really challenging because I had I, I had never written like the, that kind of thing before where two people had just such a vastly different opinion of something. Or more accurately, both of them had similar opinions about something, but had to debate on opposite sides of the spectrum. And one of them had to realize why magic was so important in this setting. For Clutch, uh, right now we're still in the process of writing a lot of things. What, one of the things that I had to anticipate doing is that I, I am working on one of the episodes where there's a lot of jokes that I would normally make in a setting like this that my writers are like, yeah, you can't use those jokes. They don't work here. Or they are, they are either taboo or they are not expressing the tone that you want to go for. And I'm like, okay. Because I, I have a problem where I can get a little bit dark in my humor uh, sporadically. Mm -hmm. And that's not a great idea sometimes, especially for a kid's show. So my, my writers kind of like reel me in a little bit and they're like, okay, maybe, maybe not do that. We, we, don't want to, we don't want to make something that would upset parents and scar children. And I'm like, that is a very good point. I grew up watching Don Bluth, so my childhood is not a great example for that. <laughs> I mean, they're going to be scarred in life eventually. Anyhow, you're just speeding up the process. <laughs> True, but if I'm going to be making a show about something that's for all audiences, I might want to be a little bit more respectful of that. I mean, kids are kids are smart. Like they're not going to they're going to pick up on any kind of joke that I end up making of like, oh, was that a naughty joke or oh, was that a really messed up dark joke or something? But it it also helps that like one of my writers uh, has a, a degree in child psychology. And and hearing her perspective on this kind of stuff is is very very helpful. I have a tendency to to blunder in some whoopsie doodles, which we we affectionately call yellow cards and red cards, which are like things in the script that we probably shouldn't be doing, or we should probably self censor or try to do something better. An example is like we have a with Krillia's spine shatter. She is a very lethal individual, 
but we don't want her to be like so lethal that she's talking about like gore and evisceration and stuff or like you know stabbing someone and reveling in their suffering as she watches them die no we, we don't want to do that that would be that would be bad but we we still make her like really intense where she she is not beyond indiscriminately suplexing somebody you have such a great cast of characters you have a great voice acting you have everything seems to be going extremely well with this and i'm sure the kickstarter is going extremely well uh as well yeah we so. we've uh as of right now we have twenty thousand on our eighteen thousand dollar goal but we have stretch awesome. goals to make more episodes uh and also a plushie of strap Ooh. which would be very appealing for for some people and if we do absurdly well in the next 13 days, which I doubt we'll be able to make this amount of money, uh, if we hit $100,000, I promise that we would make an animated pilot of Clutch of Cobalt Story, which would be really cool because we've we've dabbled in animated pilots before with Magus Elgar. We actually have two animated shorts on the website that you could watch, oh. which are really cool. It's on our YouTube as well, obviously. I'll have to definitely check that out. That sounds amazing. I, I love animation and all that stuff. I'm, I'm still going to be a kid at heart. I mean, no matter what age I'm at. Well, so. like the the nice thing about anime about animation is that it's it's not like it's not a genre. It is a medium of being able mm -hmm. to express yourself. There are so many amazing stories that are overlooked simply because they're animated. Because they go, oh well, it's animation. It it feels like for me treating the entire spectrum of music used with a violin like imagine imagine like having all the genres like jazz like classical like uh rock and roll and then violin it feels weird not all violin music is the same you could do other things with it it was the same with anime versus North American animation styles. Mm -hmm. was, there was always a huge conflict between those two aspects. And yet over the past 10, 15 years, it's been merging to the point that it's actually very similar in styles in terms of at least animation and creation. Yeah. Japan kind of acknowledged really early on that animation is a medium they've got tons of like kids content sure but they also have like a lot of adult themes and adult stuff because the great thing about imagine about uh animation is that the only limit is imagination you could do so much with like what the characters are doing on those scenes you can do sci-fi you could do fantasy you could do things that would cost hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars to to make in live action that you could just make a doodle of I mean, I'm, that is a barbarously oversimplified representation of everything that's going on with it. Animation is extremely expensive, but it is also much more versatile in what you can do without requiring an entire army of, well, animators to make your stuff. Like, keep in mind, every live action movie that has that has like superheroes or or all those big things does have animators on it they do have animators on it like they, they do animate and you are technically watching a cartoon that just looks like real life don't kid yourselves people who think that all uh animation's only for children yeah, um I, I also implore that there's like a lot of really well done animation out there that are adult in theme but still have that like very appealing cartoony kid style or at the very least looks like something that you would expect out of like a game of thrones kind of thing like castlevania by net uh, by by netflix and powerhouse yeah. animation is one of the most well-written and visually arresting experiences i've gotten to watch on animated television mm -hmm. and it's based on a video game about killing dracula in uh, in uh, horrible gray tones too from the old any uh, from the old Game Boy days mm. that I remember, but also from the NES days. But yeah, the it's it's amazing. It's just there's so much that's out there that you can consume, and uh, unfortunately, we only have one life to do that. Um, <laughs> but we do what we can. Well, see, I like to think that the most exciting part about the having one life to consume it all is that you have the process of digesting this 
these experiences, these stories, and regurgitating something truly unique yourself. I, I have just described creativity in the most viscerally unpleasant way that I probably could in that moment, but the idea is that you can, all the stuff that you, you read and, and you experience and you, you absorb, it, it helps create a signature within you of, of combining these elements. I'm not going to pretend like I'm original. I'm not going to pretend like I didn't just take a bunch of things that I watched when I was a kid and repackaged them in a way that I found really appealing and fun. But that's most stories. Uh, but before I do that, is there anything I haven't touched on, and we'll get into social media as well at the end of the show, uh, that you'd like to showcase for those that are watching and listening to this interview? As I mentioned, I'm working on the Kickstarter for Clutch a Cobalt Story. It's going to be concluding in about 13 days. So you have the opportunity to help support us. You don't have to like put a lot of money into it. Like Even like a dollar or like five dollars really makes a huge difference for us. And it also enables us to do the work that we love to do. Uh, I, I have a massive team of incredibly passionate people who really love doing this kind of stuff. Those are the best kind of people to work with. If you do decide to just support us, you can still get your hands on a lot of like fun collectibles, like a U the USB stick about the show, the soundtrack, your name in the credits as an honorary Cobalt member of Clan. Fine, you're a Clan now. Let me sleep. And if we manage to hit our stretch goals, namely the thirty thousand dollars stretch goal, we will be opening up a collector's pin set of uh, Nam uh, book and Gaujinvor the Crimson, the name of the dragon that they they, they serve. Uh, we we did have a collectible of Strap the Trap Maker as a pin for like our early backers, um, and we I don't know if we'll be able to open it up again for for people who missed it but want to get their hands on it. But um, at the very least, if you do support us, uh, you can and and we hit that goal, we'll be opening that up as an add on so that you can actually order those pins. And they're, they're really, really well done pins. They're going to be made by uh, wizard pins who uh, focus on uh, really high quality enamel, uh, like black, like really soft enamel pins. And they're really cool. Sent to yourself. This will all be over soon. Open your mind, Morpheus. You need to <laughs> expand your mind of all those things. Free your mind. There is no spoon. Drift your car. <laughs> everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today who was that for you i would have to say a friend of mine that goes by the name of drew vaughn when i met him he was an animator that was going to college trying to learn how to do animation things and eventually had gotten a job at electronic arts what i loved about this gentleman was that he was insatiable in his passion he was drawing every day. He was pushing himself every day. There was never a moment where I came to his house and he said, I'm not doing anything right now. He, he would have like his, his drawing uh, easel like right out in the open in the living room. He would be surrounded by artwork of his own creation. And he would always be talking about, I'm trying to learn VR or I'm trying to learn animation. Or I've, I found this, this footage of wolves and I want to animate wolves for like a year and a half now and i was just invited to work on a game where i can animate wolves <laughs> now he's uh, one of the lead animators over at thq nordic I i'm so excited for him and so proud of him because he's been coming up with a lot of really cool ideas for the projects that he's been working on and that he's been in charge of and he has expressed that he feels the same way about like myself about like my own passions of trying to push forward but it really speaks volumes that the people that inspire you the most are usually people that you're surrounded with that are trying to make something, that are trying to push themselves to make more things. From a professional perspective, you are a sound design engineer wizard. 
I'm going to call you a wizard because you, you are a master of that. I hearken myself a magus, thank you very much. <laughs> so from a professional standpoint, you are very successful in everything that you have created and will continue to create. You are also running an amazing Kickstarter with uh, an amazing world that you have created. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I don't in the slightest. Because <laughs> you see, here here's the thing. I... I did not have a lot of success when I started out. When I first got out of college, I, I was jumping from uh, uh, freelance job to freelance job, trying to find anybody that would actually be willing to pay me money to do things. And I couldn't for a lot of it. Uh, the closest thing that I have ever gotten to a studio job was working at Awesomeness TV uh, which are now known as DreamWorks Television, uh, doing Draw My Dream. And I never got to set foot in that that studio to actually work. I would just show up in that office, pick up a hard drive and leave um, because they, 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 they wanted nothing to do with me. No, I'm kidding. It's it's because like it was a lot better. It was a lot more efficient for me to just work at home because driving to that office was like a hour and a half drive in L.A. traffic. But I, I still have not gotten a studio job in the 10 years that I've been working. Uh, I have I've never done that kind of thing. And I am still working paycheck to paycheck, trying to make ends meet. And it is very much one of those kinds of uh, career paths where my jobs are measured in days, not years. So I, I and it's not because like I get fired. It's because I finish the work and they have no more work for me. So I have to go find something else. Uh, but I, I don't consider myself that successful until I, I, I get like a, a real studio job or my show manages to get greenlit and like supported by by some big company then says like, oh, you're, you're clearly skilled enough to make these things, make things for us for a living. Because most of the stuff that I make is just my own stuff. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I have failed lots more than most probably i go through steps of failure very much like people go through the the steps of grieving death i kind of go into failure kicking and screaming or if i if i mess up i i have a moment of despair and and frustration like i i've had moments where like i'll have the opportunity to pitch like an animated series to like Cartoon Network or something. And I'll be like waiting for months and I'll be really excited. And I'll be, be like holding my breath for, for the entirety of that time, which is completely unrealistic because I'd be dead. Then I would get a response from them saying like, yeah, no. I'm like it took you six months to say no. Yeah, no. I'm like, yeah, no. Sorry. <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll have that moment of like, what have I done? I worked so hard for nothing. I don't deserve to live. <clears throat> and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll curl up in my bed for a couple of days and I'll maybe eat some ice cream and go into diabetic shock once or twice <laughs> in my attempts to self-medicate with sugar. I'll, I'll get over it because that feeling is temporary for me. And I'll say, OK, what can I do next? How can I how can I come back from this? What can I where can I go now? Because there's been a lot of times where I've I've failed so hard, and then through that failure, I find success. Through the failure of not being able to find a studio job, I made Magus Elgar and gotten nominated for Best Original Work in the first thing I ever made. In my failure to make an animated pilot of Magus Elgar, I was offered the opportunity to sound design Has Been Hotel. In my efforts to fail pitching a show to BBC, I managed a really successful Kickstarter. Like it's it's through those failures that I end up learning things and end up having new opportunities open up. So whenever I deal with failure, I try not to let it dominate me for too long. I, I give myself that opportunity to grieve, but I, I, I get over it eventually. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an animator, sound designer, actor, or whatever they'd like to be creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I'm going to tell you something that I would have really liked to have heard when I was a kid. 
it was something that my parents had encouraged. My parents had always encouraged me to to do what I whatever I wanted, but it was a little bit difficult to for them to put into words this particular thing that I had learned as I was going on. Inside each and every one of you is an inner magic that that special something that makes you who you are. And I'm not meaning this like in a, in a special snowflake kind of way. I mean, you have a unique perspective about how the world is around you. There is going to be very few people out there that have the same kind of configuration of experiences that you do. And also different ways of interpreting those similar experiences. Keep that magic cultivated into something. It doesn't matter if it's something that you don't want to share with anybody or if you want to share with the world. What matters is that it's yours and that it is something that you can eventually offer to the world around you. And for better or for worse, for good or for bad, it's yours. And that should be cherished. Might not be perfect right away, but what things are. I imagine the first draft of Harry Potter or Star Wars was an absolute train wreck. But the only thing that's separating you from making something really good that is going to be like as big as like Star Wars or one of those things is, well, let's be frank, a lot of luck. But what's important is that a piece that helped make those things was that perseverance and that inner magic that they never allowed to snuff out. So keep that magic. It is literally the first ingredient to your story. Slightly undercut by cat constantly coming in front of my face. I apologize. That no, that's that's all right. I mean, it's wonderful words of wisdom to to have, and I, and I hope people take that to heart truly. Because once you lose the magic, you're just what's the meaning of life? You've survived an interview on Two Geeks Talking. I do greatly appreciate it. So thank you so much. I'm expecting my T-shirt. If I survived, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt, as is well, as, as is custom of these experiences uh that being said though thank you again kennedy for coming on the show i do greatly appreciate it before i let you go where's the kickstarter how can we find you on social media how can we help support you as an amazing creative person? you can find the kickstarter if you look up uh, clutch a cobalt story i'll also provide a link to have in the description down there somewhere uh you can also find me at kennedyphillips.org which you can see in the little uh name tag down there you can also see me on twitter at magus serling that's m a g u s s e r l i n g or clutch kobolds which is uh c l u t c h it's a k o b o l d z yeah that yeah, clutch kobolds uh, where you can see little previews of of the show. You can also hear a little bit about like the Cobalt getting up to things and lots of really fun artwork by incredibly talented artists. And I really hope to hear from you guys. You can also listen to Magus Elgar um, by going to MagusElgar.com. Uh, it is completely free and it is 11 episodes long. So if you have a long drive or have some laundry to do, it is five and a half hours of magic-y goodness. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. And again, thank you, Kennedy, for coming on the show. You can, of course, find this interview and thousands of others on our website, twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that up. Thanks for listening watching on. You have been watching Two Geeks Talking. Thank you for watching.